Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. I am your host, Apostle Eddin. And on today's episode of Dissecting Apologetics, we'll be watching together a bunch of clips by Sheikh, uh, what's his name again? Asim Al Hakim. Sheikh Asim is known for his matter of fact uh, attitude and the way that he answers questions very bluntly. And I kind of like that about him, that he doesn't beat around the bush, but I don't necessarily like the content of what he preaches. So those two things can can be very different. I like that he doesn't make up excuses. He says it somewhat more or less as it is in Islam. But on the other hand, what he says is kind of terrible. Uh, so in this series, we watch the videos together and I um, give you a chance to listen to his words intently and dissect them, see what he's saying, what he's not saying, what's in between the lines. Uh, and it's usually a lot of fun. Um, but first, I want to let you know that given the nature of the topic today, uh, it will get a little bit raunchy just because of, you know, the content of, of his videos today. And also, I'll take liberty to make a few jokes here and there. So I'm just warning you ahead of time. If you're not in the mood to listen to that kind of thing, you know, uh, adults only kind of jokes, then you might want to skip this one. But it should be a lot of fun. And since the topic is going to be, you know, um, spicy. I fully expect this video or this live stream to be demonetized and not have any ad revenue on it. So if you would like to support the channel, you know, links are in the description, all that good stuff. But either way, I'm, I'm doing this live stream. Should be a lot of fun. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you, uh, Mage Crafter, for becoming a member before we even started the stream. That's very kind of you. So without further ado, let's add the Sheikh over here. Oh, yeah, and, and um, heads up, you can enable auto-generated captions if you'd like. And this sheikh, he, um, he offers sessions for those who want to talk to him. And might I say, that is a very expensive session. But uh, why book a session with him when you can listen to his hilarious answers for free? So let's begin. You have reverted to Islam and your family are still... Yes, uh, Christian. Okay, so what's the problem? Christian. And I'm, I'm practicing Islam now. Okay, what's the problem? I don't know if that is a thing, not doing the religion of the husband. Oh, your husband is still a Christian? Yes. Okay, first of all, Alhamdulillah Azza wa Jal, that Allah the Almighty has saved you from darkness into the light and from kufr into Islam. This by itself would save you from eternity in hellfire and will award you a seat in paradise if you manage to die on Islam and not change your ways. Now, when you accept Islam, you... So I just wanted to pause here to remind people, uh, we hear this a lot from Muslims, uh, Muslims who say that we're all people of the book. If you're a Christian or Jew, then there's a chance that you would go to heaven and all that kind of stuff. There are a lot of Muslims who are a bit more by the book and they say, no, you have to be a Muslim. You can't just be a Christian because Christianity has been corrupted and so on. So yeah, this guy says you have a, a seat in Jannah, as, as he put it, uh, saved for, an, for eternity because she has joined Islam. And her question, this, this poor woman is, what do I do about the rest of my family, namely my husband? I mean, that's a question that a lot of converts have, not just the relationship part, but how do I look at the rest of my family members with the realization that with my newfound belief, I am going to heaven, they're going to hell. What do I do with that information? But in this case, she's specifically asking about her husband. So what does he say? You, as a rule of thumb, cannot be with a non-Muslim husband. So you have to give him da'wah, you have to call him to Islam, and you have to tell him, honey, now I have ex accepted Islam, in my religion, in my belief, I cannot be with a non-Muslim husband. So we have a choice. We are at the fork of the road. Either you accept Islam and we can continue to live as man and wife and enjoy this beautiful religion together and continue to live our lives as a couple and end up in paradise as a couple as well with the grace of Allah. If you don't... So uh, I sped him up a little bit because sometimes he talks a bit too slow for my liking. Uh, for those who are not aware, a Muslim man can marry a Christian or Jewish woman, 
uh, but that's it. He can't marry, uh, as they call it, a polytheist or something else or a non-theist. But it doesn't work the other way around. Um, <laughs> sorry, I just want to highlight this comment by Oshin. Yeah, he's telling her to tell her husband, honey, you're, you're going to hell. Um, anyway, so she, a woman is not allowed to marry. A Muslim woman is not allowed to marry anything except a Muslim man. And I think the rationalization for that, and this is just my my hypothesis here, is that they view, of course, a Muslim like this, the sheikh, this kind of Muslim views the household as man first. You know, it's a man led household. So if he, if she's in a marriage where the husband, the man is a Christian or a Jew or something else, then their kids will be that religion and he will call the shots based on their, that religion. So that's why a Muslim woman is not allowed to marry a non-Muslim man. But a Muslim man can marry those women because he can impose his rights in, in as they call it his rights over her and he can have the final word about what religion the kids are and what rules they follow so that's just something insidious to keep in mind but basically he's saying you need to sit down your husband and say honey you got to convert or else this this is not going to work if you don't want to accept islam i have no other choice but to leave you and leave my life behind because the moment i accepted islam this is a full life transformation I have submitted my will to the Almighty, not to human beings, not to man-made laws. So whatever Allah wants me to do. Hold up, hold up. Um, first of all, it's, it's a huge red flag whenever someone has to change their entire life all of a sudden, no matter what it is, whether it's for religion, whether it's for a, uh, a diet, whether it's for a lifestyle, for a cult, it's all the same. It, it, it's not a good sign. Unless that person is in dire circumstances, for example, and they're say an addict then yes they got to clean up their life and they got to change their habits it might be very drastic all at once but it, this sounds like a person who joined the religion he wants her to completely uproot her life and discard anything that doesn't match the new religion and that is how a lot of converts get isolated and then they get stuck in this new life if they disconnected from all their friends and this is not just exclusive to islam you you see that with a lot of high control groups namely other religions and cults um, when people disconnect from their loved ones then they have no one except this new community and if they have any issues with that new community or the new religion that they signed up for it's difficult for them to go back because often people in their life are are not welcoming to them again or maybe they're even scared that the people in their life will not be or that people who used to be in their life are no longer welcoming to them uh, so it isolates a lot of converts and he's telling her to do exactly that you need to uproot your life and dump this man if he doesn't convert to islam in a few days ask me to do i will do it and allah ordered me in the quran to the almighty not to human beings not to man-made laws oh yeah and and, and that's something that i want to highlight as well he says I'm submitting not to man-made laws, not to human beings, but to the Almighty. And I call bullshit on that. Um, the Almighty, is the Almighty in the room with us right now? W which version of the Almighty are you talking about? Effectively, um, people like him, they get to say a lot of rules. And he might actually be convinced that these rules came from the Almighty. But as far as we know, there's not a single religion or ideology that has not come from another human being. All we know is... You know, at the top of the chain is a guy told uh, told other guys that God told him in a dream or God told him in a cave or God told him in whatever. But we've never actually seen or verified any of that stuff. So, no, these are not rules sent by the Almighty. These are these are rules made by men claiming that the Almighty said them. So you can't just say I'm submitting to the Almighty. You're submitting to one um, specific idea of the Almighty. So whatever Allah wants me to do, I will do it. And Allah ordered me in the Quran. Whatever people say that Muhammad said that Allah said that I should do to correct him. And in the Sunnah, and this is a consensus of all Muslims, scholars and non-scholars, that a Muslim woman cannot be married to a non-Muslim. So you have the choice. And give him a few days to think it over. No intimacy, none whatsoever. is totally prohibited for you because he's not Muslim. If he accepts it... Give him a few days. So... Muhammad spent how long preaching to people and most of them didn't join up until he came back to Mecca with an army but he expects a random Christian guy to convert in a few days why because he's convinced of the validity of Islam because he suddenly sees the truth 
No, the only reason he would convert in a few days is that he doesn't, so that he doesn't lose his wife. So he's being pressured to join Islam. Yeah, and and like Naqib says, you have a pro, you have a choice. I don't know what choice there is right here. He accepts Islam. Alhamdulillah, it's a win-win situation, and may Allah Azza wa Jal grant you the reward of him accepting Islam. But if Ooh, he's and and that, that, that's something that's also a bit of a red flag. Um, I'm not saying that everyone who converts people to their religion or every Muslim who proselytizes or every Dawah person is greedy for this specific version of reward, but it is something to look out for. Uh, the idea that if you convert someone, you get good deeds for it. And sometimes some people even believe that it's like a, a, a revenue stream, that their good deeds reflect on you on the day of judgment. So it, it what does that look like? It kind of, it's vaguely pyramid shaped, but I can't remember what, what that's called. Um, that, that is a pyramid scheme if I've ever uh, heard one. The more people you convert, the more hasanat you get. And even though it's not about actual money here, it's not about uh, dollars or whatever currency, it's about this, this fictional currency of good deeds that save you from going to hell. And again, I'm not trying to paint someone who converts other people as a, a, a malicious person. But for many, it can be a motivator that they're trying to save themselves by by bringing as many people as possible into the religion. So he says, if he joins, uh, then that is a great thing. That's because you get his good deeds. You get good deeds for, for making him join. It is fishy. But if he's defiant and adamant not to change his religion, then there Ooh, is no other let's, choice let's for him. And I will grant you the reward of him accepting Islam. But if he's defiant and adamant not to change his religion, then there is no other choice for you but to leave him on immediate impact and effect and move on with your life. And I Listen to how he said it. If he's adamant and defiant, adamant and de defiant, they make it seem as if like the guy knows the truth. He knows that Islam is true, but he's being adamant and defiant. Not that he's not convinced to change his entire life and his his uh, worldview in a couple of days because his wife is forcing him to i don't think that that's defiance that's just being a human who's suspicious of this sudden change that that he's supposed to go through or his wife is going through it's not really defiance so be careful of that kind of framing and how that framing if you're a believer and you're watching this i'm speaking to you as well careful with how this language affects how you view other people's beliefs and lack of belief because with language like that, defiance and stubbornness, you already paint them in your mind as someone who's malicious or evil or doing something wrong when they're doing exactly what you're doing. If you're a Muslim and your wife converts to Christianity and she said, you have a few days before, you know, I, I, my, um, I don't know, my, my faith counselor or people at the church told me that I should not be with you unless you convert and you just have a few days to think about it and you don't convert. Is that because you're adamant and defiant and stubborn and whatever, or because you genuinely believe that there's something wrong with this conversion and that you're content with your life as it is right now and you don't believe in this new system that she's uh, coercing you to join. So try to put yourself in the other person's shoes before using language like that. Does he have anything else he wants to add? And I hope this answers your question. Yeah. He's talking about non-believers as if we're rebellious teenagers. It is very infantilizing language. Uh, I want to read this. Um, first of all, thanks for the super chat, ASNSR. Sprinkle the word honey for damage control. Uh, do you want to change your entire life for me, honey, uh, in a couple of days? CPD says, ex-Muslim here, I used to study fiqh. To be fair here, there are some exceptions where a convert woman to stay with her husband based on permission by Umar bin Khattab. Well, we don't have an emir anymore, and uh, Omar al-Khattab is not around anymore. I, I wonder how exceptions like these were meant to work long term, or if now they have to go to a sheikh to grant them an exception, or, or how that would work these days. But either way, uh, um, sheikh, sheikh Asim thinks she needs to change her husband immediately or leave him, otherwise he's being stubborn and whatever he said. Um, let me play the next video. So the, the first the first video is very, very tame. Okay. It only gets worse from here, but I just wanted to ease you into it with, with the first video. Let's let's listen to this one. This is titled, Can a wife refuse intimacy with her husband if she doesn't enjoy slash feels uncomfortable? 
What is he asking? An anonymous uh, questioner says, as a wife who feels uncomfortable during intimacy always and informs her husband about how she feels and he just apologize, apologizes and it's the same way always. And she doesn't want to offer herself sometimes because she doesn't get excited about it. Is she sinful if she says no? Now, if we were to answer this question, most likely the feminists would, would draw their guns. And the feminists would draw their guns. I mean, he uses it as a filthy word. Um, now I'm starting to think, should feminists uh, start arming Muslim women, you know, just to have protection against their husbands? <laughs> He's making it seem as if it's extremely ridiculous to for someone to want an answer to that question. I mean, I, I am not a Muslim anymore. I don't think I should go to a sheikh to ask that question. But if there is a Muslim woman, a Muslima, and she's curious, sheikh, what, what, what do you say here? He thinks that's a feminist drawing a gun to his head. No, they, they want to know because the religion gives a lot of power to the man and they want to know what they can do about it. It's not about those crazy feminists, you know, being all up in arms about it. But yeah, just g give us an answer, Sheikh. And wage war. Wait, wage war because, she's, because they want an answer to the question, what do I do about my husband who coerces me or pressures me to have sex with him when I don't want to? And if we don't answer this question, we would be accountable at the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal for concealing knowledge. So, SubhanAllah, just do it for Allah. This answer is according to Islamic rulings, according to the Quran and to the Sunnah, whether people like it or not. This is not my job to make them like it. My job is to clarify the rulings to the Muslims who ask about it. What is the ruling? Number one. If there is harm physically on the woman, she is permitted to refrain and not offer. Wait, he, he had to say harm physically. If there is harm, phys the only kind of harm that he acknowledges is physical. So if there's a physical thing stopping her from having sex, she has the right to say no. But if there's any other kind of harm, no. Not offer herself and not permit him to harm her. Oh, okay, okay. I really want you to listen to the, the wording of this. I'm going to slow it down to the normal pace because this is brain. the wording is very important here. Is the ruling. Number one, if there is harm physically on the woman, she is permitted to refrain and not offer herself. And she, he, hear this, she is permitted to refrain. She is permitted to refrain and not offer herself. Not, he has no right to force himself on her. I don't think this is a language barrier, by the way. This guy's English is, is great. She is permitted to refrain. Like, again, it's the onus falls on her to do something there. It's not that the guy needs to put it in his pants and just, you know, find a better time or talk to his wife about why she's not comfortable having sex. No, she's allowed to refrain from offering herself. It's just putting the entire onus of the, the, the whole operation on, on her, like it's her fault. And not permit him to harm her. And not permit him to harm her. That, that's what I wanted to highlight. And not permit him to harm her. Have you heard of victim blaming? Have you, are you aware of the concept? Because this is exactly how it's done. I mean, we're not even talking about... Uh, the worst of situations that could happen in a marital dynamic where the guy just has his way. And this guy says, not to permit him to harm her. To refrain and not offer herself and not permit him to harm her. This is her God-given right. Number two, if she is only not feeling excited and she's not enjoying it, but it's not harming her and there is no hardship on her or physical harm on her wait wait wait! wait. He, he walks that back there's no hardship or physical harm but is all hardship just physical harm it is prohibited for herself to it is prohibited for her to prevent herself from offering herself to him because this was very confusing to follow is prohibited for her 
to prevent herself from offering herself to him. It's all her, her, her. Where does the guy come in? Don't answer that. Um, but yeah, it's it's word salad that is meant to put the onus on the woman. So if she doesn't like it, she's not permitted to... What did you say, Sheikh? It's prohibited for her to prevent herself. It's prohibited to, for her to prevent herself from offering herself. It's all about her. From offering herself to him. Because marriage is based on such intimacy. Why would a man marry a woman and pay a dowry and open a house, put a roof? Hear this. Why would a man marry a woman and pay a dowry? So you hear a lot about how Islam is so feminist and the woman's money is hers and the, the man's money is theirs. There's a lot of talk about money and how much money she's owed and how the guy has to take care of her. But that money doesn't come pro bono. This It's not free. There's a lot of strings attached. They get to hold that money over your head all the time. Like here where he says, the guy paid money. The guy paid money, he gets asked. Like that, that's the equation here. He's not, she's not allowed to refuse him sex unless she's physically incapable of it or unless she's sick or something. But he paid money. He opened a house. He, he did the part that he's supposed to do. Why could she possibly say no? The roof and marry a woman and pay a dowry and open a house, put a roof on her head provide for put a roof on her head provide for her so all of this th that is presented sometimes as as privileges or perks for for women it's not it's a transaction it's something that they will hold over your head very often and it's something that if they pull from underneath you if the rug gets pulled from underneath you you're by yourself you're on the street you don't know what to do you don't have a marketable skill because you don't know how to provide for yourself because unfortunately a lot of women or dare I say girls, are put in this situation from a very young age where all they know is to be a wife, from even from before they're 18 in, in many situations or before they've graduated university, even if they just graduated university, they don't know what it's like to live a life independently, whether they were in their father's house their entire life, and that's how it usually goes, uh, whether they didn't even finish education, whether they work or don't work, they end up being in a situation where they're dependent on a man for an income and for a life. And without him, they don't know what to do. And then they're owed, the, the husband is owed things for that. So as he puts it, why would a guy spend all this money just to have a woman say no to him? This is the perfect, this is the perfect arrangement for, for incels, to be honest. All you got to do is get the money and you know, convince a, a man to get his daughter to marry you and make sure that she doesn't say no. And then you're set. You just pay the money and you're good. And pay a dowry and open a house, put a roof on her head, provide for her, provide for her food, not ask her for any financial contribution, none whatsoever. Why would he do? Again, again, it's all about money, 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 money. So as long as she doesn't pay money, she has to pay another way. <laughs> it reminds me of those... Um, those memes about, you know, I'm sorry, I don't have any money to pay you. I hope there's another way we can settle this, except in those situations, in those, you know, jokes about, about porn scenarios, the woman is offering. In this situation, she's coerced to do it. Would he do that simply so that he could enjoy staying with her and being intimate with her in a halal way? If she prevents him from having his right, if she prevents him, again, listen to the language. If she prevents him from having his right. Rights, the prophet, without any legitimate reason. Without any legitimate reason. <laughs> again, the only legitimate reason to this guy is if she's in physical harm. Otherwise, there's no legitimate reason. Prophet told us, alayhi salatu wasalam, that the angels would curse her all night long till the break of dawn. And this is every single night. And this may sound silly to some of us, uh, because I, for one, I don't believe in angels or devils or God or any of that stuff. So I don't think if, if I were in that situation, I wouldn't feel um, distress from hearing the hadith that angels are cursing me all night long. But there are many people who do believe in that. And I don't think that their feelings or their experience should be discarded or dismissed or ridiculed just because they believe in something that we view as unlikely or nonsensical. So if a woman does actually believe 
that the hadith or stuff that the prophet said and she believes that the prophet is the best man ever and that god told him to say things then she believes that if she doesn't put out the angels will curse her and somehow that's going to influence her her um, position her seat in the afterlife if she actually believes this stuff then she will put out against her will again i remind you it may sound ridiculous to you and me but what matters is that the end result is there are a lot of women who are put in these situations and they are forced to, to just comply because what's the alternative? Um, either being abused by their husband or maybe even divorced and have no income or the angels curse them till they go to hell. It, it's, it's sad, really. So this is a major sin and she has to be really careful not to do that if she and notice how the, the i mean this is terrible and if, if had it been done the other way around i would still think it's terrible but the fact that it's missing says a lot there is no hadith about how the guy who doesn't know how to please his wife or doesn't want to please his wife he will be cursed by the angels and by the hurlain and whatever there's none of that there's no hadith about how the guy who can't get it up for his wife is a terrible person or the guy who doesn't want to put in the effort. None of that stuff. None of that. But for the woman, the language is always blaming her and there's all these mechanisms to pressure her to put out. Um, yeah, I'm not going to read some of the live chat. It's funny, but I, I can't read it on the stream. If she is not happy in the marriage, she can bail out. She can ask for khul'a. Give him back his dowry. Okay, okay, let's let's clarify. If she's not happy in the marriage, she can't bail out in the sense that, hey, I want a divorce. I'm going to contact my lawyer or I'm leaving. That's not how it works for a Muslim woman. Um, for a Muslim woman, as he said, she can ask for khula. She can bail out. She can ask for khula. She can ask for separation. She can request from a judge and make a case to the judge. She has to go to another man Right, like this, this woman is being mistreated or um, coerced by a man, and she has to go to a different man and tell him, "Please, dear sir, sheikh, judge, I beg you to let me divorce my husband." She has to make a case, and then she has to pay him back the money that he was so, you know, he he slapped it on the table. And he's like, "This is the money that's for you because I'm such a good Muslim man," and then she has to pay it all back. Um, so don't let don't let sheikhs fool you with the whole narrative that women have rights in Islam and money is, is to honor the women. No, it's a tool. It is a, it's a, a tool that is used to control the women. Give him back his dowry and she goes to her father's house without no problems, without any harm done. Oh, again, again, hear this. She goes back to her father's house. He views women as property that transfers ownership from the husband to the father like she she can't exist on her own it can't possibly be that she moves to an apartment and continues working her job and does well for herself no she moves back to her father's house because she's like a child like like a like a house plant like something to be nurtured and cared for because she can't do it for herself and in many situations, that is true. But why is that true? Because they infantilize these women up until they hand them off to the first man that marries them. And they're still children that are grown up and they don't know what to do in life. And I don't blame them. It's difficult to have that kind of upbringing and know what to do next. So as he says, if she's unhappy, she's supposed to go beg a judge to let her be divorced. And imagine a situation, which happens a lot, by the way, where a judge says, nah, you didn't make a good enough case. Or in the meantime, as she's presenting her case, like, for example, imagine if the case is the sex with my husband is very lousy or he forces himself on me and I'm not happy with our sex life. That man will now be embarrassed and humiliated. Um, and for a lot of Muslim men, honor and these sorts of you know image are huge, huge things. So what will a man who has the right to discipline his wife, his, the God-given right to beat his wife, what do you think he'll do when his wife goes and tells a random stranger, a, a judge, and in front of other people, I don't want to be with this man because he doesn't please me sexually? Do you think she'll be safe in that situation? So, no, it's not that she'll just, you know, as he put it, uh, how did this guy put it? Be really careful not to do that. If she's not happy in the marriage, 
she can bail out. She can ask for khush. She doesn't just get to easily just bail out, go back to her daddy's house and chill at home. That's not how it works. That's not how it's supposed to work. That's not what women actually want. They don't want to be cheated, treated as children who then go back to father's house. For khush problems without any harm done, but to stay in the marriage and for him to provide for her and to live with her without having his rights, this is unfair and illogical. Finally. I don't think you understand what logic means, Sheikh. I, it's, it's terrible. Uh, it's, it's funny that he calls anything illogical. I mean, coming from a guy who thinks that bases his entire life on God told a man who told a man in a cave. It's, um, yeah. Kenny says, uh, this happened before and the prophet told her she couldn't divorce her husband till they have sex. Remember the hadith with the woman who turned green from beating? Yes, if you'd like to link that hadith, I'll have it in the description later. There was a hadith where a woman was beaten so hard that her skin turned green. And she went to Aisha, the prophet's wife, the prophet's favorite young wife, and, and told her about this. Told her that since that verse was revealed that men can beat their uh, their wives, Women have been mistreated so badly. And she said, there are no women mistreated worse than Muslim women. And then she, she told the Prophet, it's, her skin was as green as this garment that she was wearing. And the Prophet told that woman, uh, it, it was all hadith that I've showed before. He asked that woman, why do you want to divorce your husband? And, and she said, well, he's impotent. And the guy said, no, I'm not. And he had two children. And Muhammad said, well, if you want to go back to your ex, you have to have sex with your husband before you can get a divorce and then go back to your ex. It was a whole convoluted mess. So no, it's not like she can easily say, hey, I, I don't want this marriage anymore. He could force her to have sex with her current husband. Um, it's, yeah, it's terrible. Now, I told you it gets worse and I will fulfill my promise because it gets much, much worse. But be before it gets um, dirty worse, I'll, I'll, I'll give you another terrible women blaming hadith. Sorry, not hadith, clip by Asim. Let's listen to this one. And Yahya says, what are the conditions if one wants to marry a girl he has committed zina with? Can he marry her or leave her for good? I mean... I don't want to be too nitpicky here, but I, but I will. Uh, a girl, I mean, wouldn't it be better to say a woman? Why are you having intercourse with girls? But, you know, moving on. First of all, zina is a major sin. Oh, so for those who don't know, zina is basically premarital sex. It could also mean um, adultery, but in this situation, they mean premarital sex. And without any doubt... It takes two to tango. So we always hear them. Wait, when you hear this, you think that he's going to go in a somewhat progressive way here. Uh, not even progressive, somewhat non-woman hating way. That it takes two to tango. I thought when I heard this, I thought he was going to say, well, we can't just blame the woman and demonize her because, you know, there has to be a man there as well. But he, he takes it a bit outside that uh, that narrative. I'm crying that is here. Them crying that a man betrayed us. He promised me to marry me. He did this. He did that. And after he got what he wanted, he ran away. So she. So instead, he says, "I always hear them." crying that a man betrayed us i mean if you hear it so often doesn't mean that it is happening so often but and then also if it happens so often that women in your community or girls as he put it are being uh, misled and lied to and scammed by men who say i'm gonna marry you and then they don't and they just have premarital sex with them and make them feel used and 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 um and ineligible for a proper marriage and so on if it happens so much why do you think that is? It's not that because the women are crying victim, as he's going to put it. It's because the men in your community are predatory and the women in your community, or girls, as he put it, don't have enough um, 
education about the topic, don't have enough real life experience. If you raise her as a child and then she gets scammed by a man, what do you expect? Because that's how you raised her as a little child who cannot live a life independent of the man of the house. But instead, he takes it in a completely different direction. He says, these women, they cry victim a lot, but it's their fault. She portrays herself as the victim and the man to be the perpetrator, without any doubt. The man is a perpetrator and he's sinful, but she's not exempted. She is as sinful as he is. Because, I mean, if... It's it's funny how he, he goes on this rant about women crying victim when no one mentions that. The question here is, can I marry a girl I committed zina with? And his bias is immediately showing. The question isn't, um, what do I do about this guy who scammed me into having sex before a marriage and then dipped? In that case, I'd say, okay, his bias is kind of there, but it was kind of relevant to the question. No, the question has nothing to do with that. And he goes on a rant about how women cry victim, but it's actually also their fault. Because she's not a child. She's a girl. Uh, debatable. She could be. I mean, have you seen the rules of, of marriage in Islam? Grown up woman. And she took that sin, the burden upon her. Wait, if she's a grown-up woman, why are you calling her a girl? Again, infantilizing language that people don't realize actually matters. When you call women girls, but simultaneously she's a woman when it's time to blame her for something, pick a lane. Shoulders. So she is a sin. A sin. The burden upon her shoulders. So she is as sinful as he is. And we're not condoling anyone. And we're not pointing fingers at anyone. They're both in the same boat and they are both sinful. Now, again, if if he just mentioned, you know, in a different context that both of them are equally sinful, I would say fine. You know, in the eyes of God, both of them are equally sinful, but there could be some responsibility put on the man because of the power dynamics in that culture or in that situation. But the question has nothing to do with who's more at fault. And he just goes on a rant about how women are not victims. Yahya says, if a person committed zina with a woman, can he marry her? The answer can be technically and can be an advice. So technically speaking, if they both repent, and this is a condition, because Allah stated in Surah An-Nur, Okay. Um, wait, finish that. Is not married to, except another adulterer, or a idol worshiper, a mushrik. Okay, so first of all, it's funny how in that verse of Surah An-Nur, um, an adulteress can only marry another adulterer or an idol worshiper. Um what does so-called idol worshipping, by the way, again, a misconception that a lot of these sheikhs and Allah himself allegedly makes is that they think they're worshipping the idols, not worshipping through the idols, the same way that Muslims worship through the Kaaba. They don't worship the Kaaba itself, but that's a discussion for another day. But what does worshipping through an idol or even worshipping an idol have anything to do with premarital sex um, it goes to show that they label certain groups as basically filthy or or other and that includes those who have committed or have part partaken in uh, premarital sex and those who worship idols in the same category even though those two things have nothing to do with each other and secondly how are you supposed to repent so say you had premarital or outside of marriage sex with um with someone and then you decide to get married islamically how do you repent for premarital sex if like you can't do premarital sex after sex i mean after marriage once you're together there's no need to repent for it because you're not doing it again anyway but th that's besides the point so in order for the marriage contract to be valid both of them need to repent. Secondly, she can't be married until we are certain that she's not pregnant, meaning that she has to get her menses once to prove that she's not pregnant. 
I mean, I'm, I'm curious about that. Um, so if she does get pregnant, he can't marry her, even though he made her pregnant. So what's this? Again, there's a lot of women blaming here because then she will be labeled as the one with the bastard child and the one who committed Zina. The guy, from the guy's point of view, it's no different than jerking off that morning. Like the, no one can tell that he's a, a father or a um, a father who who noped out on his on his girlfriend or wife or whoever and and their their daughter or son but she's ineligible for marriage if she's pregnant by the guy who is about to marry her that makes absolutely no sense thirdly he has to propose to her father who is her guardian and if he again again okay so is she a child or is she an adult so he was talking earlier about how a woman is, is a grown-up woman and she's not a child and she bears responsibility and so on. But now he's infantilizing a woman again. He has to go ask permission from her father to marry her. And if he accepts, then they can get married. Mm -hmm. This is the technical advice. But is it advisable? Just because you Listen to this made part. a mistake, a heinous sin, would we demand and require that you go and cover up for this mistake with another mistake, which is marriage. This is not advisable. You have to first look into the girl and to yourself to see if you are both compatible or not, to see that whether she is worthy of getting married to or not. Is she a good woman? Would she be a good wife? Or is she someone who's foolish enough to maybe attempt to have another relationship and commit zina again? Again, with the, with the victim blaming here, or the woman blaming. Um, so in this situation, they both have premarital sex. And as he said, it's equally both their responsibility or fault or whatever. But then he goes to vilify her. She's foolish. She might cheat on you. She might have uh, premarital or, or extramarital affairs. So it's not advisable to to marry damaged goods. My brother in Christ or my brother in Allah the guy is in the same exact vote. So how do we know that the guy isn't going to go around, according to your logic, and sleep around and he might be foolish? Is he a good husband? So, and the difference between them is, again, the guy gets to act as if he never lost his virginity. The woman cannot act that way. But he, she's damaged goods. You, you can move on. He's advising them, yes, technically you can marry her as long as you didn't get her pregnant and so on and you ask her father. But I wouldn't advise you to do it because she's not she's not a good woman, brother. But by the same logic, not that I think that premarital, extramarital sex made, makes you a bad person, but I'm trying to highlight this sheikh's bias. He dismisses the woman as damaged goods, but the guy, he advises him to find a better woman. But by your own, wasn't that, 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 um, that verse that he just cited, that the person who has premarital sex or extramarital sex and the, is only destined to marry someone else who has extramarital sex. So why are you advising the guy to shop around and get a better, better woman when he's also in the same damaged boat, according to your logic? Um, it, I, need, need I say more? And again, and again. So this is something he, that hear this, hear this part. To attempt to have another relationship. L listen to how much he vilifies her. Be a good wife, or is she someone who's foolish enough to maybe attempt to have another relationship and commit zina again and again and again, again and again and again and again, because these two people had premarital sex. Suddenly, the woman is likely to have extramarital affairs again and again and again and again. But the guy, yeah, you should chop around. So this is something that you have to look into and uh, Allah knows best. But there's no obligation. Who's best? Who's this best that Allah knows? Does anybody know? Chat, tell me who is best. Okay, moving on. Uh, the next clip is going to get a bit raunchy. So prepare yourselves. His sec oh yeah, and to answer this question, Muslim men don't have affairs. Not only do they sometimes have affairs, but they can legally marry someone else and if you are back in the days of the prophet um yeah you could you can have slaves and everything there, there's a hadith that i wanted to show that is sort of 
relevant, but we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Let's just play the next clip. This one is about um, oral sex. The question is, is oral sex permissible in Islam? The second question was about oral sex. And I cannot go into details, of course, but let it be known that in our religion, it is prohibited for a person to touch his private parts while urinating. It is prohibited to... Wait, that's that's the first one. Um, you can't touch your private part while you're... How do you aim? <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I just had to. What are you talking about? Cleanse and purify yourself with your right hand after answering the call of nature, whether urinating or defecating. And the scholars say that this is obvious because Allah honors the right. The left hand is to be used for dirty things. So the right is honored in Islam. Now, I ask you a question. Okay, so I, I just want to address this for a second, the superstitious nature of this. Um, so the right is honored in Islam and you receive your good book of deeds by the right and you eat with your right hand. If you eat by your left hand, you are cursed. And if you receive your book of deeds on the day of judgment by your left hand, then you're, you're doomed. That's superstition. And it's not just um, exclusive to Islam. Muhammad found that stuff around him. He grew up with that stuff and he co-opted it into Islam. There is no reason. I mean, the most close thing to a rationalization that I've heard is that well if you just if you eat with your right hand then back then they didn't have great hygiene or soap and so on so you should only clean yourself with your left hand so there's no cross contamination between what you eat and what you you know poop out that i can grant you maybe there's some wisdom in that but there's nothing inherently bad especially today when you don't even need to touch this stuff we've got bidets we've got uh, soap we've got everything we need toilet paper everything um you can eat and clean up and do whatever with any hand you want. There is no inherent um, negativity from the left hand nor virtue from the right hand. That's just superstitious mumbo jumbo, goo goo gaga, uh, right bad, right good, left bad. Th that means nothing. To a question: Which is more honored, your right hand that you eat with, or your mouth that you say the shahada with? There is no such thing as, as an honored organ, uh, hand or mouth. I, I don't. Am I chat? Am I high right now? What is this question? I, I didn't quite understand. Which is more honored? Which is more honored, your right hand that you eat with, or your mouth that you say the shahada with, that you recite the Quran with, that you say the name of Allah Azza wa Jal with, to be. Do, do you see where this is going? Okay. Used in such filthy things that we did not learn except from the kafir, even the dog. Okay, you heard it here first. We learned oral sex from kafirs. Is this an admission by the sheikh in his world that, that Muslims can't give head? Is that what you're saying, sheikh? Because I don't think that's necessarily true. I'm not saying that. But the sheikh is saying that we learned oral sex from the kafirs. <laughs> I, I, I don't think that's true. I think people figure out sex uh, in many ways on their own. The dogs may not may not do this. The, the, animal. the dogs may not do this? What, what are you talking about? So the, one should refrain from such filthy things. One should refrain from such filthy things. So he, he talks a bunch about how the right hand is better than the left hand and how you're not supposed to even touch yourself while urinating with your hand. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I just, I just had to say it. it. It's so funny. So yeah, basically his answer is no, you, you should not uh, have oral sex because that is stuff that only the kuffar do. And I pity the sheikh's, uh, spouses. I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know what else to say, Law. but yeah, I, I've, from what I know, there's mixed opinions about whether or not it is haram. I mean, from all the research that I've done, it is not explicitly haram, but it is makruh, like it's not recommended. And some sheikhs think because of the reasoning that he gave that you speak out of your mouth. So how could you 
you say Allah's name with your mouth. So how could you put that in a, such a filthy place? Do you find your wife's genitalia filthy? Like that's that's a you problem. I don't think that's inherently a humanity problem. Uh, but either way, I mean, by that logic, why say anything if you use your mouth to say the name of Allah? You can't say anything obscene because you can't use the same organ. Um, you can't use your hand on your partner because you use it to hold the the mushaf. So it's 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 crazy. Um, next video. Hmm, how 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 filthy should we get? Because some of these videos are very filthy. And again, I apologize. That's not me. That's that's him. Um, this this one. Okay, let's let's do this one. It's about masturbation. So in this video, it's titled "Does Allah forgive those who masturbate and commit other major sins?" Let's hear the sheikh. Allah forgive those who masturbate. Let it be known to every single Muslim. And non-Muslim. Let it be known. That Allah Azza wa Jal forgives all sins when the sinners come. In <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm a child. Um, let's, let's hear it again. Allah all forgives all sins when the sinners come. Sins what? when the sinners come in repentance to him. Ah, okay. Allah does not reject anyone. Even if you kill someone, even if you rob, even if you fornicate, even if you do the most heinous sin ever a person thought of, once you repent, feel remorseful, come to Allah asking him for forgiveness, Allah will forgive you. Okay, so let's let's hear that again. Um you can do anything. You can kill people. And I don't want to say other more terrible things. You can um, inflict harm on any living thing, whatever age. You can force anyone into doing anything. Allah will forgive you if you repent. Allah Allah's so merciful. But don't you dare, don't you dare believe that there could be any entity aside from Allah. That one Allah doesn't forgive. Allah watches you murdering and pillaging and doing all sorts of stuff. And he's like, well, it's, it's fine. He's going he's gonna to repent later. It's, it's all good. Um, but Allah watches you, I don't know, going into a temple? No, 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 no. You done fucked up, son. Where's the logic in that? Allah said in the end of Surah Az-Zumar, if I'm not mistaken, that, oh, my servants, do not despair from my mercy, for I forgive all of the sins. And Allah says twice in Surah An-Nisa, chapter 4, that Allah Azza wa Jal does not forgive those who associate others with him, and he forgives anything else to whom he wishes. Meaning that those who die while committing shirk, visiting dargahs, seeking help, and, ben uh, and, and, and benefit from dead people or seeking refuge in jinn or whatever, or uh, in Ali or in Hussein. They are okay, so I want to talk about this, but first I want to highlight this is a very good point. Um, how cheap this makes self-forgiveness because invisible man forgave you. So on one hand, I personally, I, I, I can understand the allure of how easy it is to forgive yourself or believe that God forgave you and then therefore you should forgive yourself. And when you leave religion, you might struggle with this particular point. Like I've struggled with that because I have no God to forgive me. I may commit um, a harmful act. I, I don't want to say sin because I don't believe in sin, but I may do something that is harmful to myself or someone else. And I feel bad about it. And I, and I don't want to do it again. And I even make amends for it. And I still feel bad because I don't have that little bit of uh, forgiveness that I was programmed to seek of, you know, God forgives you. So you're all good. But it's it's hard, but I'm learning to find other ways to forgive myself. But a person in that situation, if they don't realize that it's difficult to forgive yourself, and it should be difficult to forgive yourself in some situations, it makes it easy. Like there was this hadith, and someone please uh, quote it here if, if you remember it, about a man who killed some number, like 98 people or 99 people, and went to a sheikh and asked him, or went to a wise man and asked him, can I repent? 
I killed 99 people or 90 whatever people. Can I repent? And the guy said, no, you've killed too many. You can't repent. So he killed him. And then he went to ask another one of those wise people. And then he died on his way to that other town where he was going to ask the next guy. So he killed about 100 people. And when he, when he died, the angels didn't know what to do with him or about him. And they were arguing. So he was about to repent. Does that mean that he's forgiven? Or because he committed all these things, he, he killed 100 people, he should not be forgiven. And they said, okay, well, let's measure the distance between the town that he was going to go to to repent and the town that he committed his last murder in. And I think according to, had to the hadith, Allah moved him to be closer to the town where he was about to repent or moved his dead body so that he will be forgiven. What bullshit is that? So the lesson here is that Allah will forgive you no matter what. But the real lesson here is that you can do whatever you want. As long as you say, Allah, I am sorry, then whatever you did to other people doesn't matter. And from an outsider's point of view, again, Allah doesn't exist as far as I believe. Um, none of this afterlife stuff exists. So to see a man murder 100 people, if that story is even true, or do whatever, and then repent and think, well, Allah is going to make it fair to the people I've harmed. There is no Allah to make anything fair to people that you've harmed. All that we're in is this reality, and you forgave yourself because... Allah said that anything is forgivable except shirk, like the Sheikh was saying. Sorry I interrupted you, Sheikh Asim. What were you saying? They are kafir and mushrik and they will go to help benefit from dead people or seeking oh, yeah, yeah, this part. jinn Listen or whatever, to this part. inventing shirk, visiting whom he wishes. Meaning that those who die while committing shirk, visiting dargahs, seeking help and, ben uh, and, and, and benefit from dead people or seeking refuge in jinn or whatever, or uh, in Ali or in Hussein, they are kafir and mushrik and they will go to hell for, for eternity. So uh, let's talk about this for a second. So shirk in Islam is associating anything else with Allah. And that is still, like a polytheist, for example, is viewed to be a uh, mushrik because they associate other gods with Allah. But I think that is a poor understanding of other people's religions, including by the supposed Allah himself. Because a lot of the polytheists, maybe around the Prophet, they believed in several gods. One of them is called Allah or something. But a lot of polytheists who have nothing to do with the Abrahamic religions believe in multiple gods and none of them are called Allah. So it's not associating other gods with Allah. It's not even being aware or dismissing the entire concept of an all-powerful God called Allah. And they have their other ideas about magic entities and, and you know how the world came to be and all that kind of stuff. And they're both equally valid, which is to say not really based on anything um, measurable or provable. So... In this worldview, why is someone who who believes in multiple gods or different gods than Allah, uh, first of all, they're not committing shirk by, by the traditional uh, meaning that he's describing here, but they will be considered to be committing shirk. But why are they morally reprehensible for doing so? Because again, the basis for believing in Allah and the basis for believing in other gods or multiple or a single are more or less the same and more or less... no not provable, not more or less, actually not provable. So why is one person morally more uh, terrible than the other? Why is one person worthy of God's wrath because he believes in the wrong version of the same convoluted story? Um, and he, he mentioned here something that I want to highlight as well. Hussein, they are kafir and mushrik. People who, who ask for shafa, who ask for um, well, intercession, so people who ask for other dead people like saints or holy men or um, other figures in religion, some of them might be related to Islam as well, like in, in Shia circles. I'm not as, as aware of those. But there are people who believe that if you pray to this entity to ask for intercession, to pray to God on your behalf, you might have better fortune or that you might uh, your, your judgment might be more favorable. And according to this sheikh, that is the thing that God will not forgive. But why? I mean, in the worldview of someone who believes in jinn and angels and afterlife and God and heaven and hell, is it so far-fetched for them to believe that praying that some guy is closer to God and will pray to God for them, does that make them a terrible person? Does that really warrant them being tortured forever just because they fell for that little bit that you don't believe for believe in. Like, for example, people will ask Muhammad for intercession. But if you ask any other man, 
then no, you deserve to be tortured. You're committing shirk. But if you ask Muhammad, then you're fine. Why? Why does it, how does that make sense? I mean, I get it from his point of view. It's because God said so. But from an outsider's point of view, it's the same mumbo jumbo. Like, I don't see how one is more morally reprehensible than the other. Or whatever, or uh, in Ali or in Hussein, they are kafir and mushrik and they will go to hell for, for eternity. Other than that, Allah, if he wills, forgives it. So whoever... So again, Allah will forgive you for masturbating. And, and it's, it's on equal footing, by the way. Masturbating, murdering, uh, forcing someone against their will to do something. They're on equal footing in the eyes of Allah. But don't you dare pull an idol and do a prayer. That he does not forgive. I don't respect a God figure with those priorities. Like how, um, how tiny is your ego? really, as a God, that you think, if you, don't, if you don't worship me, if you don't praise me, if you dare associate any other gods with me, I can never forgive you, that I cannot imagine something worse. I will, I will take this personally, and God took that personally, and he will torture this person till the end of time, or never, there's no end of time in, in that worldview. But a guy who's committed many, many murders Hitler himself had he repented to Allah before he died. Oh, that's fine. That's my homie. How does that make sense, Sheikh Asim? So I don't know how we got here from masturbation, but basically, as long as you ask Allah for repentance and you don't pray to other gods while you're doing it, you're fine. Commits a sin, do not despair. Just run to Allah. When you fear something, you run away from it. Only Allah, when you fear him, you run to him and he accepts your repentance and Allah will forgive you. But you have... Oh, I, I, I really want to talk about this part. He says, when you fear something, you run away. Except Allah, you fear him, you run towards him. So if you have this, this worldview that he has, you're supposed to be terrified of so many things related to Allah and his wrath and his punishment and his rules. But run towards Allah. It's, it's like it's Stockholm Syndrome, really. It's making you love your abuser while it's abusing you so that you know nothing else but to love your abuser. You run towards Allah, the scary thing. You run to him and he accepts your repentance and Allah will wow. forgive you. How but merciful. You have to do that now. Do not In no other context do we praise this. In no context do we think, you know, I love my husband. He scares me. He terrifies me. But I run towards him and I love him. We would think, damn, girl, run to, uh, away from him, not towards him. But... <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to read this comment. Run to Allah when you want to master. I mean, in a sense, yeah, to stop you from doing it. Um, as Matt says, I scare you because I love you. In no other dynamic do we praise fear and, and do we mix fear and love. Only in Islam and maybe other religions, you're supposed to fear Allah so much and love him and love that you fear him and be proud of your fear of him. It's, uh, it's really psychologically damaging. Do not postpone, do not delay, cut all the things that facilitate the sin for you, such as sending your gaze freely, watching porn, uh, uh, watching TV, movies, etc. All of these things, they provoke you to do such a sin, especially the environment that you're living with and in and the uh, uh, um, friends you're hanging out with. Change this, run to Allah and Allah will accept you. Fahim from Saudi. So it's funny, he says the friends you have. I've never had a friend who... Um makes me more likely to masturbate but that's just me i don't know what kind of friendships you guys have uh, you guys and gals uh, but, and i, I want to highlight something here it's not that i'm saying sitting around all day masturbating watching pornography that is the way to live that is good for you but as i spoke about this and I, I touched on this in, in my video um about set my story with sex and islam the way that islam and you know the people who preach islam make you terrified of it of sex and masturbation make they vilify lustful thoughts they make it such a forbidden thing it pushes you to dark places it make it puts you in a bad position where you can't enjoy sex or masturbation in a healthy way you can't develop in a healthy way and then at the same time you know you, you find yourself rushing to get in a halal relationship and just trying to coerce your partner into sex it's it's a very terrible dynamic so I'm not saying that I want you to do the opposite. I want you to, you know, masturbate all day and, and waste your day. 
there's a, there's a healthy way to do these things, but I'm certainly not going to go and learn about masturbation and sex and relationships from a sheikh. And I urge you not to go and learn about these things from a sheikh. Um, there are two videos, and, and I'm just going to do one because of the time here. I'm trying to choose. Tell me in the chat, would you want me to do the raunchier, more gross video? Or do you want me to do... I mean, they're both kind of gross. <sighs> hmm. Let, let's, let's just do one and see how we feel. Okay. Now, here's, here's the next video. Brother says, after having intimate relations with my wife, do we have to change our bed sheets each time? and wash them we do i cannot imagine going to someone and asking them that question let alone a sheikh i i cannot imagine i mean that's a decision for you and your wife to figure out you don't go ask a sheikh 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 how do i wipe myself how do i clean my bedroom should i be cleaning my bedroom <laughs> why <laughs> why do you think the answer lies at the you know, the, the hotline of a, of a sheikh. Why? We do not use condoms. So fluid from me will get on the sheets, either semen or pre-seminal fluid, what a flex. or the fluid will be from my spouse. I read on Islam Q&A that if mevi is on the sheets, it is junub. But if it's many, it is not. But doesn't mevi always come out before many? Please clarify. This issue is an issue of dispute since long time. This issue is an issue of dispute since long time. How much do sheikhs and scholars talk about uh, pre-ejaculate and semen and, and these topics? Why is it an issue of dispute? What's there to dispute here? No words, no words. But I, you know how they say Islam has contributed so much to science and blah, blah, blah. I'll grant you that there were people along, you know, the, the historical timeline. And, and today there are a lot of scientists and doctors and people of science who are Muslim. But it's not that Islam contributed to science. People who follow Islam, some of them contributed to science. Most of the people, and it's funny because the word in Arabic, ulama meaning scholars, also means scientists or people of science or people of knowledge. But it's not interchangeable. The people of knowledge in Islam, they spend their days debating these topics. I imagine the manpower, the amount of debates that were spent talking about um, seminal fluid and, and pre-ejaculate and whether or not you should wash your sheets. That has nothing to do with uh, you know, adding to scientific development in any way. This is what they waste their time discussing. But the vast majority of Muslim scholars, they look at the evidences. What is the evidence? <laughs> what is the evidence? <laughs> A wet spot on your bed? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Chef. First of all, is many, and many is semen, or sperm so is many or, or semen is it pure or najis what comes okay i, I have to start to, to explain some words here so it's funny because a lot of people myself included uh, a lot of people from that background did not have sex ed but the closest thing to sex ed that we would have is listening to someone like this talk about the differences between the fluids not in terms of what they contribute to, um, to, to the sex, the process of sex, but in how Allah views them as filthy or not filthy. Um, so the word, what was the word? Uh, najis, najasa or, or najis, it means filth or filthy. And some things that are considered najis are like a dog is, is najis. Uh, if a woman has her period, she's in a state of filth or impurity and she can't pray because she's in that filthy state. Uh, and now they're discussing which of these liquids are filthy and which of them are pure, as, as he called it, uh, unpure or pure. Or, so or let's see again. Is it pure or najis? 
what comes uh, they, um, they don't mean pure as in as in free of con in from uh, from contaminants they mean pure as in good or not bad comes out of a person is either urine and this is najis or um the which is uh, the prosthetic fluid that's pre ejaculate by the way and this is also najis usually it comes when there is intimacy or fl or flirting with uh, the spouse and there is wadi and this is yellowish a little bit uh, thin that comes usually after urinating or when carrying something that is heavy or when it is extremely cold i, I don't know chat um can you relate <laughs> are you ever lifting in at the gym and then there's yellow stuff i i, I don't know what he's talking about uh, again i have not been to sex ed class but i'm fairly certain that this is bullshit. and in all of these three are nudges and then we have semen and this is for men and women however women uh women don't have semen uh, I, I don't know what kind of women you've been i mean biologically what we consider to be sex by birth women uh there's no semen involved in that as far as i know have something extra which is the continuous vaginal discharge which is an issue of dispute in the most authentic opinion is that it is again issue of dispute Sheikh sit around disputing women's discharge chat is is women's discharge real <laughs> not najis and it does not nullify wudu it is more or less like sweat so when we come to the issue of semen many we have a hadith which is authentic that mother Aisha okay this gets really gross and I'm sorry but that's him this is on YouTube this is not me okay he has this video on YouTube for, uh, uh, narrated may Allah be pleased with her she said that whenever there are traces of semen on the garment of the Prophet if it is dry I would rub it off with my fingernail which means that if it's I I mean I'm sorry again I warned you okay that's not me that's Muhammad um, and that's Muhammad's young wife doing this I can understand that they lived in a desert not with a lot of water no soap so you got to do what you got to do but we don't then consider that a standard for hygiene or we don't really take that seriously today but he uses that to classify the type of fluid as clean or unclean based on what Muhammad's dried fluid Aisha did with I told you guys I told you it's gross I'm sorry but we we have to listen to it you signed up for this if it's hard substance rubbing it in, rubbing it off does the job and if it's wet, no 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 it it does does not does not do the job um damn um imagine just scraping it off and then going to work or something do not shake hands with with this man i would wash it now scholars from this hadith they learned that semen is pure because whenever there is an impurity rubbing it off does not make the surface or the garment or the cloth pure you have to this, you see how scholars and learning, they have very different meanings in Islam. When they say that God tells you to learn and you know there's a lot of scholarship involved, that's not what we think of as scholarship and learning. So you can learn, you can infer from a hadith about scraping dried semen that semen is pure. That is a learning. That that's, you know, if you were doing this on Duolingo, you get a check, you get a thing, good, good job. You learned something today. No, that, that's not what learning is. Uh, so when they say that Islam promotes learning, I'm not saying that all of Islam is this stuff. But keep in mind that what they mean by learning is inferring stuff back from he said, she said, that the Prophet and his wives did this. So we learn something about reality today, which is that semen is 
pure, whatever that means, because she scraped it off and she didn't have to clean it. You have to wash it. But when pure, you have to wash it. But when she told us that rubbing it off does the job, this meant that semen is pure. And again, I'm not inferring or implying here that all of Islam is stuff about crusty, Muhammad's crusty clothes. But if this hadith is treated with the same degree of authenticity and wisdom and, and learning as the hadith about how to discipline your wife or you know how to deal with a dispute of a, of a land or whatever else it is, it's the same guy. It's the same mechanism that we're learning from. So if the same guy you can learn from him that you can scrape off semen and that's all good and that's clean, that's the same guy saying other stuff. I want you to keep that in mind. Again, I'm not saying that the entirety of Islam is this stuff. But it is the same degree of authenticity. This is the same mechanism that people used to learn about what Muhammad thinks God said or what Muhammad said about Islam. Now, how did this semen reach that area, that garment? Was it mixed with pre-seminal fluid, Madhi? What are we even talking about? Was it mixed with his spouse discharge? This is something we do not have knowledge of. This is one of the miracles. <laughs> we, we do not have knowledge of that. But we have the basic knowledge. That is, whenever there are such discharges on your bed sheet, mixed with semen, then this is pure. Hold up. I'm, I'm trying to follow his logic here. I'm really, really trying, okay? So because you can scrape it off, or Aisha scraped it off, and Muhammad went to pray with scraped off whatever on his clothes, then it is pure. But when you mix pure with impure, the result is still pure. I'm sorry, what? Like, didn't you mention a listicle of all the you know, gross fluids that are not considered pure, that are considered nudges. And then, and then you say when it's mixed with pure semen, then it's all pure and it's all good. That's not even how it, that's not how purity works. Do you understand what the word pure means? Or even cleanliness or whatever you want to call it. Even, even in his worldview, one of the things on the list is pure. So when they're mixed together, they're all pure. That's, that's not how that works. Because we don't have details of what Mother Aisha did. May Allah be pleased with her. And the I think we have more than enough details in, in that scenario. Content of what she rubbed off. And hence we assume that... What are you even talking about? ...is sufficient to be removed. And if not removed, it is still pure, regardless of what was mixed with it. And this is the most authentic opinion. So whether you have... Guys, this is the most authentic opinion. <laughs> I love that there's degrees of authenticity about what you should do with crusty clothes or crusty sheets. Um, so the question here was, do I have to wash or change my bed sheets? And he's saying, no, you could still go to pray after it because Aisha did it. So, or Aisha and Muhammad did it. So you're fine. Whether you have it on your bed sheet, whether you have it on your clothes, it is pure. Is it disgusting or not? Definitely. Finally. But it doesn't affect the validity of your salat if you have it. Would it be recommended to wash it? Yes, sure. But again, it is not a determining factor whether your salat is accepted or not because Mother Aisha told us that she used to rub it off the Prophet's والسلام, garment. I'm, like, I'm not trying to make the religion look bad. This is stuff from the Sahih Hadith. This is not me digging deep. He's talking about it. Um, but it, it's funny, as, as Roxanne said, semen is pure because it's from a man. And it's not just because it's from a man. It's because Aisha cleaned it with that method. Therefore, it must be pure. Because according to his logic, anything that you can scrape off and you don't need to wash is pure. Um, 
but vaginal discharge is disputed because it's from a woman. Even in body fluids, Islam is misogynistic. Um, it took him this entire long answer to basically explain God's fine with it. You can pray on after sleeping on crusty sheets. God's okay with it. Maybe you want to wash it for personal reasons, but God's cool with it. But let's assess God's, um, uh, what's it called, consistency here. If you don't know this, it, while you're praying in Islam or before you pray, if you fart or if you have used the bathroom, even if you used the bidet in the bathroom, even if it was, you know, number one, number two, whatever, you cleaned yourself, doesn't matter. If you farted or used the bathroom or touched the dog, uh, you're supposed to go and do this uh, abolition wudu. I don't know if it's English uh, abolition, if, if that's how you pronounce it. You have to do wudu. You have to wash yourself in a certain ritualistic way. And that washing has nothing to do with your genitals. In no step of that washing do you wash your genitals. But even if you're in the middle of prayer and you fart, you have to exit prayer and you go do wudu again and then you start from the beginning. But wudu doesn't clean my butt. So what's the point? Why does Allah get offended or feel like you have to start all over, you have to do this ritualistic cleansing if it doesn't clean the part that is most affected by the filth? But so, yeah, so if you fart, you can't pray. Or if you farted an hour or two hours ago, you can't pray till you cleanse yourself. But if you are Muhammad and you have crusty thobe, your clothing is crusty from, you know what, liquid, and your wife scrapes it off, you're fine. What logic is that, Sheikh? I, yeah. So don't take advice on hygiene or, um, or sex or relationships from a Sheikh. Definitely not Sheikh Asim. Uh, late night kaiju. Thank you for the super chat. They say some money to compensate for you having to sit through this nauseating content in order to critique it. I really appreciate it. I I don't expect much uh, revenue to come out of this this weird live stream. I don't think it will be monetized. I mean, I'll try, but I, I really don't think it will be. But I, I really felt like um, highlighting some of Sheikh Asim's um, most notable takes on sex and relationships in, in Islam. If you'd like to see me critique some of his other stuff as well, notely all of his um, opinion on opinions on women, uh, I'd, I'd be happy to do that another week. Let me know in the chat below. And um, again, I want to thank everyone for joining and for being part of this community, uh, especially those who have supported this channel through uh, Patreon or YouTube and have become members of the Discord community. That's how I find a lot of these videos is by suggestions from uh, Discord members. So if you want to be one of those people, check out the, com the description below to see how you can join. And thanks again to all the donors and supporters over the months and years. I could not do this without you. Like the live stream and tune in for the next one. And as always, think critically and think for yourself.